what better place to talk about play than at Legoland? I'm here at Hotel Legoland in Denmark, where I've spent the last few days at a conference called the Idea Conference from the Lego Foundation that was focused on learning through play. And today I'll be talking with a friend and colleague, Eric Hansen at the Lego Company, about the value of play. Uh, so here I'm starting out with my Lego dragon, but let me also show you one of the things I like best about being at Hotel Legoland is this wall of minifigs behind the registration desk. Let me give you a closer look. I'm going to sneak behind the desk here. I've told there are more than 5,000 minifigs along this wall, each one different than the next. There's a bicycle here where you can see through with a magnifying glass to see more and more minifigs. Minifigs forever. So we're here at a little Lego swimming pool at the Lego company. Uh, I've been told not to kick around too much. We'll make too much noise for the video. Uh, so I'll try not to play too much during the talk here where I'm together with Eric Hansen, who's a product innovator, works on product innovation at a part of Lego called Future Lab. Uh, but we've worked together for many, many years, almost 30 years ago. Uh, we first started working together on some of their earliest work between MIT and the Lego company. 30 years is a long time for two big institutions like the Media Lab and Lego to collaborate. I think one thing that's held it together is there had been a set of shared values right from the beginning. I think, you know, in our group, we've always valued the idea of children learning through designing, creating, building things. So that fits so naturally with what Lego's about. Yeah, it fits totally with our vision, and mission is to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow, and that's really, that is playful creativity, that is yeah. joy of building, it's pride of creation. Yeah, I've always loved that phrase, I, I think Lego calls it its play mission. It, it, that's our it, play promise, so play that's promise. what we promise to, our, to the users of Lego Bricks, is really that you will experience joy of building and pride of creation. And yeah. I, I think anyone who has seen a child demonstrate or show off to his parents or to peers what they have built, You'll see that in their eyes, the pride of yeah. creation, the joy that yeah. they have experienced yeah. in building what they Well, have I've done. always loved that phrase from Lego, the joy of building pride of creation. Because the Lego, you talked about that with thinking about these bricks. I think everything that we've designed in our group at the Media Lab, we also aim for joy of building pride of creation. Yes. So I think sort of the, our visions are so well aligned, which is what's led to such a great collaboration. Like in that very first collaboration, I remember it, was, we were, it got started when some top executives at Lego saw Seymour Papert from the Media Lab talking about new approaches to learning and education, and they were inspired, and they wrote to us. And we were already working on a way to connect Lego with computers. So we were so excited to hear from the Lego company and you know, that we got together and we started working together to bring Lego together with the Logo programming language that Seymour had been working on. So we're developing ways for kids to build with Lego, their might Logo programs to control what they built with Lego. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and when I first joined Lego as a young uh, technician, I thought I was joining a toy company. And, uh, and I guess the, one of the first projects I worked on was actually the project together with you and found out that we were much, much more than a toy company, that there was this deep passion for children's play and learning and how we could help them have better lives in schools. And I think one of the what we experienced uh, one of the first times we tested this first product was uh, teachers saying, you know, time for recess, uh, you can take a break now. And the kids said, you know, wait a while, we are, we are busy, we are doing something. And that's when we knew we were really onto a powerful idea. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think that combination of kids both building in the physical world, but then use the computer to build also, build programs. So they're doing these two types of building. But I do remember right from the beginning, there were some challenges to make sure that as we added computers to the Lego experience, that it remained playful. Because there were some people who, at least back then, felt, well, it's important to be taken seriously. If we're bringing into schools a new computer activity, it better be taken seriously. I remember the first prototypes that they showed us, they only used black and yellow bricks because they wanted to be taken seriously. And I remember us saying, no, it has to be colorful. It has to be in the Lego spirit. Yeah, I remember those. Uh, they're actually the colors of uh, wasps, uh, the nature's uh, uh -oh, symbol of, of warning symbols. Uh, uh, but anyway, and they were replicas of machines, like milling machines and automated uh, robot arms and so on. 
but the kids when they started playing freeform with this, they were building playgrounds and, yeah. and merry-go-rounds and so on, and that was a natural introduction of the minifigure to the models right. because there yeah. had to be people around. Yeah, them. but we had to push to make sure that minifigures were included because mm -hmm. some people said no, it won't be taken seriously. No. Then we said, well, no, we want to be playful as well. And actually, that's been a continuing battle over the years to try to get minifigures. Every time there's a new robotics mm -hmm. kit. I find that I'm saying we have to put minifigures in there to make sure that it has that sort of playful storytelling approach to it. Yeah. So now, after I guess it was 1988 that that first product came out from our collaboration, the Lego logo. Uh, but by that time, electronics were getting you know, smaller and cheaper. And we started to realize that maybe we could take the whole computer and fit it inside of a large Lego brick. So we started working together on what we started calling programmable bricks. And it was probably by 1989 or 90, we had our first prototypes of a programmable brick. There was probably, I want to know, maybe like around this size or so. A little, you know, so it was, you know, so it was still it was a large brick, it was you know, sort of in your hand. Uh, but it was starting to get smaller and smaller. You could build the electronics, build the computer right into your Lego construction. And it was fantastic to have that vision of a program will break mm -hmm. and what it could do for children's play. Uh, that lasted for, it took some years before we, yeah. it actually made it to the market. Well, put, like, it was around a decade. So, and, but I, I think through that, it was part of our own playful process of constantly iterating, of going back and forth, of making prototypes, trying it out. And we, although it was a decade before it got out, uh, we were playing with it during that decade Absolutely. and continued to play with it. So I guess it was, it was 1998 that Lego Mindstorms first you know, got out to the world. But even once the technology got out to the world, I think part of what we saw as our challenge and our mission was to make sure that the ideas got out there, that it wasn't just about the technology, but it would be get out there in a playful spirit so that people would use it in playful explorations and experimentation. Yes. And, and that certainly happened that we were a little bit taken by surprise when we first launched the product because it turned out that about half of the uh, buyers of these products were actually grown-ups, yeah. uh, engineers from Silicon Valley or bank executives yeah. and you know pe people of all kinds of uh, walks but, but who liked uh, robotics and who liked tinkering. And well, just that there's a built-up you know, demand for that type of playful experience and people didn't have the opportunity right. and that Mindstorm has really unleashed some sort of pent-up demand for people to be sort of playing and tinkering in sort of robotic type activities. I know one thing that we did, I guess it was a year later in 1999, uh, to, in order to bring together that community to sort of share ideas about you know, how to do playful invention with Mindstorms, we had an event at MIT called MindFest, the sort of a festival of playful invention. And it wasn't just a festival of robotic construction, no. it was a festival of playful invention, because I think we want to get out that idea that it wasn't just build a robot, although it's great to build a robot for a robot competition. We want to show and to have people share ideas about how this could be used in a diverse set of ways to let everybody play with the technology to live out their own fantasies. And I think there are two things that really uh, stay in my mind from that festival. One thing was uh, meeting Seymour Papert there and saying to him, you must be really proud and happy today now that Mindstorm's uh, vision that he helped create uh, is finally on the market. And, and Seymour's answer was, you know, we're just scratching the surface. We only just got, got started. Yeah. And I think that's also part of the key uh, or one of the key elements in our long-term relationships that always kept pushing us, you know, there's much more we need to do and within this, this frame of shared values, but still being really ambitious on behalf of yes. the Lego company, I really, uh, it's something we deeply appreciate. Yeah. I think another thing that I remember from that MindFest <clears throat> is there were a lot of those adult tinkerers there in addition to kids and some of the people, some of the hackers who were developing software for Mindstorms. And I remember at the beginning, people at Lego were very sort of resistant to that because they felt, you know, that they had this, you know, new product, they developed the software for it. And I think it's typical of the toy industry in the past has been to be very secretive and protective that do their own development. Well, as you said, we, we spent a decade developing this product. Yeah. So we felt that we had done many things right. Yeah. Uh, and then, then the first thing that happens is that these uh, advanced users, of course, they start opening up the system, uh, taking out our software, adding their own, building new sensors, new motors, and so on for the system. Uh, writing 50 books about it during the lifetime of that product. And we Actually, I remember in the, in the very beginning, 
being in a meeting with the top executives at Lego and arguing about why it was important to be open to yes. those other people. And I remember the top executive saying, but, but what will happen if they develop some software that's better than our software? And we said, exactly, exactly. That's, what, that's what you want. Yeah. And I think that's what we found also, yeah. that when a thousand advanced users start working on it, of course they can come up with solutions that the seven engineers we had at Lego didn't think of. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it led us to this thinking about open innovation, which is just a notion that 99.9% .9 of the talent on this planet does not work for Lego, yeah. so, but we, they probably grew up playing with Lego bricks, so they probably have something vested in the Lego brand and, and would be happy to help uh, with our product innovations. Yeah. And also we thought of that for the people who hacked our products at that time. Our mission is to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow, and when we looked at the activities these people were doing, we were sure that they were both inspired and developed. So it, it certainly fulfills our mission and it also led up to the second generation of Mindstorms that we designed for openness and that is open source all across and that was developed together with lead users. Yeah. So it's not just to inspire the, the builders of tomorrow but be inspired by the builders of tomorrow as That's well. That's exactly, trying to close that loop and yeah. really uh, see the, the potential because many of our users are highly talented and working with them is the best we can do. When I think back about you know, our collaboration, as we said, part of the reason for its success is having these shared values. But I think also some shared uh, practices and uh, approaches that the fact that we aren't just interested in supporting kids in playful experiences, but we also want to engage in playful experiences ourselves. I think as we've gone through designing different projects together between the Media Lab and Lego, I think one reason they've come, came, that they've been able to support playful experience as well is that we've had a lot of play going into as we've been developing the projects. We've been trying to take our own medicine when we talk about it. There's a lot of theories about how children should play and you know it's about experimenting, it's about being playful, it's about sharing and doing projects together and we, we're trying to do that and I think we have a lot of fun in doing so. Yeah. So the playfulness is, a, is an inherent part of, of our collaboration. Yeah, I know that like when we started working on the We Do Robotics kit that came after Mindstorms, <clears throat> that we worked on together with the Playful Invention Company, yes. you know, it was a spin-off and a collaboration that we've worked on. Uh, that we started out with like a play weekend of you know, diving in and then, and then over a number of months, constantly iterating back and forth. And, you know, I remember sort of sitting together and sort of playing around to develop those prototypes. Yeah, and I, I a highlight was when we, we had built this castle and uh, we sort of came up with a story about the princess in the, in the tower of the castle and night coming by and, and, and things happening and just sitting there in a team um, developing a storyline, programming it, selecting different sounds for it and whatnot, just had a very, very playful time and realizing, hmm, this is the experience that the users of this product uh, hopefully are going to have. Although I know there is a challenge, sometimes we get frustrated that we see that even though we design products for tinkering, I sometimes would go into a classroom and see you know, people using Mindstorms just yeah. following the instructions step by step, uh, and you know, rather than doing sort of creative exploration. So the product itself doesn't do that. We have to find other ways of carrying that message out and supporting that message. Yeah, I think we can build many of the things into the product you, to show, of course, they, they, often there is a main model, but then to have some inspiration for what else could you build with yeah. this and, and to really inspire children to think and build their own models and their own creations is yeah. really important. I, I recently saw the Lego movie, and one thing I liked about the movie was one of the themes was to, that it's okay to sort of break the rules and go beyond the instructions. So I think that should be sort of a key message that it's important to keep that to heart and to continue to, to continue to develop approaches that encourage people to break the rules, not just follow the instructions. Yes, I think it's a, it's a great message in the movie and it's a really important thing that it's much more than okay to, to build your own things and to go beyond the instructions. It's really, that's about human creativity, yeah. which is important. Now, of course, there's a challenge as we you know, continue to move into the digital age, how to maintain that playful, tinkering spirit in the digital age. I think the thing that worries me is a lot of those apps and, app and experiences on uh, you know, tablets and mobile devices don't support joy of building prior to creation, aren't designed for tinkering. Uh, it's a lot of you know, pointing, clicking, browsing, but not joy of building prior to creation. So I think we still have a lot to work on together to try to make sure that as these devices spread through the world that 
that we can keep true to the spirit of the things we've worked on together and to make sure to sustain pride of building, pride of creations in all different media into the future. Yes, and it's just about exploring the digital world because it, it has rich affordances towards uh, creativity and towards tinkering. So it's just about finding the Lego uh, identity in that, in that uh, sphere. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you.